It was many years ago when I picked up my very first issue of The Uncanny X-Men, introducing me to the merry world of mutants. And just like any kid who was presented with a whole new bunch of flashy superheroes to read about, I immediately set off to pick who my favorite would be. The basis of this choice would usually vary from person to person, but in most cases, for kids my age, it usually just boiled down to one simple factor. Who looked the coolest? For someone already familiar with Marvel's flagship heroes like Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor, you'd think that there wouldn't be anything too special about meeting even more superheroes. But even at a very young age, I could tell that there was something a little different about the X-Men. Something extra, if you know what I mean. These guys felt a little more grounded as characters, and as a group, a little more like family. A family full of new, colorful, and interesting members. It definitely was an exciting challenge to figure out who would be my de facto favorite. There was quite a lot to choose from in just that one issue. There was a majestic dark lady who controlled the weather, a hulking brute made out of metal, a flying man who used his own scream as a weapon, and there was some runt with stupid pointy hair who had claws. But there was one X-Man who I immediately gravitated to, and it was this unassuming guy in blue who sported a single yellow visor and shot out a great red blast from his eye. Now granted, shooting lasers from one's eye wasn't really a new power. A certain Man of Steel had been doing it for years. But the fact that it was just one large beam coming from a singular source where two eyes were supposed to be just made it look cooler. And just like that, Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, was officially my favorite X-Man. As I read more about the X-Men, I learned more about my newly minted favorite mutant. Cyclops was part of the original five X-Men along with Marvel Girl, Beast, Angel, and Iceman. And among the five, he was the prized student of X-Men founder Professor Xavier and the field leader of the team. Ironically, while I found all this cool, I would later learn that it was the fact that he was the leader that many found unappealing. As a result, even I begrudgingly admit that Cyclops usually doesn't make it into many people's top X-Men lists, which is usually dominated by some hairy troll with a cop-out healing factor ability. Okay, at this point, I would like to apologize that I will be going into fanboy, nerd rage territory here. But really, I've got a lot to say in defense of my favorite X-Man. To talk about Cyclops, one cannot help but talk about another fellow X-Man whose fate, for better or worse, seems to be linked to Scott Summers. And that would be... Logan. The Wolverine. There, I addressed the guy properly without insulting him. In the beginning, things were more black and white, and each member of the X-Men served a specific role. Cyclops was, well, the leader. He was the square, straight, bordering on boring leader. Wolverine, on the other hand, was the bad boy, the berserker, the guy who got to lash out at the enemies and do all the cool stuff on the battlefield. Cyclops had the unglorified job of trying to keep Wolverine and the other members of the X-Men in check, mostly to his own detriment. So as the other X-Men like Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, and especially Wolverine became more popular with the readers, Cyclops kind of stayed the same. He was the leader, keeping everyone in line. It wasn't the most popular role, but it was necessary. Given that, I would still argue that Cyclops ultimately is a more interesting character than most of his fellow X-Men, and it all starts with his properly fleshed out origin story. When he was a boy, he was riding in a small plane piloted by his father along with his mom and little brother Alex when they were attacked by aliens. Hey, it's comics. In a desperate act to save their children, their mom straps on the only available parachute to the two boys and shoves them out of the plane as she and their father are captured. Both boys survive the fall, but Scott suffers a concussion. He wakes up in the hospital and practically blows out the entire roof. It's his first manifestation of his mutant ability. The tragic twist for him, though, is that due to the concussion, Scott has absolutely no control over his power. He opens his eyes, he shoots. Period. So all he's got is his visor, or ruby quartz glasses, to keep his power in check. It's quite a unique and riveting story, if you ask me, especially when you include what actually happens to his parents after the abduction, which leads to the revelation of a third Summer's brother, and the devious and deceptive actions of one Charles Xavier. But all that would be a story for another time. Now, compare that to the origin of, hmm, let's see, oh, I don't know, some guy who has basically no recollection of his past. Ooh, mysterious. Actually, the original idea for Wolverine was that he wasn't even a mutant, but literally an evolved Wolverine. What a riot that would have been. 
And to add to that, his mutant healing factor basically means he can't die. Where is the drama there? And of course, the tragic twist of his other power. Every time he pops his claws out for a fight, it hurts. It hurts every single time. Cue the violins. But I digress. Things just got from bad to worse for Scott when the first live-action X-Men movie came out, which centered around, you guessed it, Wolverine, played by a sorely miscast Hugh Jackman. Okay, before people start bringing out their adamantium-laced pitchforks, let me go on record and say that Mr. Jackman did an amazing job as Wolverine. He oozed with character and charisma, and every amount of praise blown his way is well-deserved. But... What he did was reinvent Wolverine into a leading man, which in my opinion, he wasn't. The X-Men was about a team, and on that team, he served the role of the Berserker, the guy who lost his shit in battle. Wolverine was not supposed to be the leader type or the prized pupil. That role belonged to Cyclops, who unfortunately got shoved into the background along with all the other X-Men to make way for Wolverine's greatness. As the years passed and Marvel realized that they had a gold mine with Hooverine, they decided to make the most of the situation and basically shoved Wolverine in our faces wherever they could. Suddenly, it was no longer the X-Men. It was Wolverine and the X-Men. And of course, when that wasn't enough, they committed the greatest travesty, in my opinion, by adding Wolverine into the ranks of the Avengers. Ugh. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Again, this episode is about Cyclops. So, no X-Man suffered more from this meteoric rise of Wolverine than the original leader of the X-Men, Cyclops. To be the best, you had to beat the best. And to establish Wolverine as a top dog mutant, Cyclops had to go down. He had to become as unlikable as possible. First, writers started portraying Cyclops as a militant mutant leader. In 2011, the X-Men had a major event called Schism, wherein Wolverine and Cyclops finally have enough of each other and split the X-Men team in half over a difference in ideologies. As it went, in a world where mutants are hated and persecuted, Cyclops felt it best to train young mutants to be soldiers, or at least learn to protect themselves from the dangers of their world. Wolverine, on the other hand, decided that young mutants needed to be sheltered and protected from the ugliness of war. Okay, so on the surface, yes, Wolverine's view seems like the more noble approach. But come on! Cyclops was just being practical. And to be honest, what he set out to do wasn't so different from what a certain professor did to him and the other young mutants when he decided to start the X-Men in the first place. Short of sending the young mutants off to another dimension, there apparently is no place on Earth where they can exist untouched and unharmed. It just makes more sense to be prepared rather than to be ignorant and naive. And then, a year later in 2012, things really got messed up in the next major crossover, Avengers vs. X-Men. Now, I won't go too much into the details, but the gist of it being the dreaded Phoenix Force returns to Earth. Sorry, if you don't know what that is, just look it up in Wikipedia. And the Avengers and X-Men fight over the potential host target, the mutant Hope Summers. The Avengers, who have absolutely no experience with the Phoenix Force, believe that the best solution would be to take Hope away. But Cyclops, having already been warned by his time-traveling son Cable of the Earth's destruction should Hope be taken by the Avengers, leads the X-Men to stop them by whatever means necessary. A major turning point of this series occurs when Iron Man comes up with a doohickey that channels the Phoenix Force into Cyclops, and it eventually possesses him. And while at that state, under attack by the Avengers, he ends up killing Professor X. Oh, by the way, prior to that, he also managed to establish world peace and end worldwide hunger in his possessed state. Just saying. Anyway, killing the beloved professor, even in his possessed state, automatically makes him hated by all the other X-Men, or at least most of them. Talk about lazy characterization, turning a bunch of heroes into hypocrites who also choose to forgive Wolverine for gutting fellow X-Man Jean Grey when she was possessed by the same force. But what many anti-Cyclops people conveniently like to gloss over is the fact that, in the end, Cyclops was right. Instead of seeing the Phoenix Force as a source of destruction, he saw it as the salvation for mutants, who at the time had their actual numbers around the world decimated to a few hundred individuals by the Scarlet Witch. Look up House of M for details. Another mutant, conveniently forgiven by the X-Men after her actions led to the unfortunate deaths of millions of mutants all around the world. 
And he was correct. Wolverine, of course, had his own solution to the problem, and that was to kill Hope. Luckily, Hope managed to fry his ass. In the end, Hope Summers managed to harness the Phoenix Force to the benefit of mutant kind. With that power, she reboots their race and opens the door for the next generation of mutants. And that's all Cyclops wanted and fought for, the survival of his fellow mutants. Oh, and you want to know another thing? While Cyclops led the X-Men into battle, before ultimately going rogue on his solo Hope murder mission, guess which side Wolverine was on? I'll give you a hint, their name doesn't start with an X. So, post-Avengers vs. X-Men, Cyclops has been labeled as a terrorist and is even hated by his own former teammates. It's really a shame that Marvel went over and beyond this character assassination of Cyclops in a misguided attempt, in my opinion, to prop up their golden boy, Logan. In fact, I believe they took the easy way out of their self-created predicament and have actually killed off the modern-day Cyclops and replaced him with a younger, time-displaced version of himself. Oh. And guess whose side brings young Cyclops to the present day, a time where it is even worse for mutants? Mr. Let's Keep the Young Mutant Kids Sheltered and Protected, Wolverine. Hypocrite. Ironically, in their attempt at tarnishing the modern day Cyclops, who eventually did come back to the land of the living, by keeping him strong in his convictions regardless of how unpopular they were at the time, I think they actually made him an even stronger and more compelling character. While on the flip side, they inadvertently reduced most of the other X-Men, led by Wolverine, into a bunch of inconsistent and one-dimensional, we hate Cyclops rabble. Anyway, regardless of how anyone feels about Scott Summers, I don't think that any true X-Men fan can deny how important Cyclops, the character, is to the X-Men, mutant history, and mythos. Case in point, while other iconic X-Men like Beast, Storm, Rogue, and of course, Wolverine have branched out and joined up with the Avengers and other superhero teams, Cyclops has remained an X-Man, and only an X-Man, since day one. He may not be perfect, some may find him boring, but no one can deny that every action and choice that he made and continues to make was and is driven by one thing, and that's the survival of not only the X-Men, but the entire mutant race. Granted, it's been years since I've really been into reading X-Men, but who knows, maybe the powers that be may have once again ruined Cyclops. But I'll end with this. From the very start, the end goal of the survival of the mutant race has long been defined by two opposite paths. One of extreme peace by Xavier, and the other extreme domination by Magneto. In the end, it took a true visionary like Scott Summers to see that the one and only path laid firmly in the middle, which is why Cyclops was the most successful in truly uniting the mutant race under his leadership. And that's where I'll rest my case for why Scott Summers deserves the title as the best X-Man ever. As the saying goes, Cyclops was right. I don't normally recommend other external links, but I came upon this blog post which goes into further detail and in my opinion, perfectly defends Cyclops from all the usual reasons he is hated by many. I'll place it in the description below. It's a little dated, but it's definitely worth a read. So are there any Cyclops haters out there? Who is your favorite member of the X-Men or mutant in general? Please note that any votes for Wolverine will be duly disregarded. Just kidding. Let me know your comments below and tell me your story. Thanks for watching Stories from the Toy Shelf Redux. If you enjoyed this story, please click on the like button and subscribe to the channel to help me tell more. Until the next one.